This project began with the question, what is authentic Christian culture? I remember approaching my professor with this question and he immediately began to talk to me about these monks at Clear Creek Abbey and this guy named John Sr. and I was a little bit confused, but as I started to look into John Sr.'s life and read his works, I, I really understood we are a group of Benedictine College students in Atchison, Kansas. Several of us are studying the Great Books program here at Benedictine. So we began to study and read the works of John Sr. at the recommendation of one of our advisors. And what we found shocked us. John Sr. recommended burning the television set, getting rid of air conditioning, being out in nature in the wilderness as a means of encountering reality, and stepping into reality in a fuller sense. And we were kind of scratching our heads a little bit at first because we're 21st century American college students. We have social media. We access our grades online on a website. And so what could Christian culture really look like for us? And so we actually traveled out to Oklahoma, the group of us, with our two advisors, and we interviewed Father Francis Bethel, a student of John Seniors who converted in the midst of the Integrated Humanities program during his time there and then um, would go on to join the Abbey um, and also write a biography of John Sr. So Father Francis Bethel shared with us in his interview that he was a part of the Integrated Humanities Program, which was this two-year program at the University of Kansas, to kind of get gen eds out of the way students could take these classes. And he was one of, his, one of the students who did that. And in the midst of this program, he just fell in love with beauty and kind of found reality in the fullness of the Catholic Church and her wisdom and her teachings. And so he and some other students actually ended up converting to Catholicism. And today he's a monk in a monastery, um, which is a beautiful testament to the way that he continues to live reality every single day. So this story all starts with a man named John Sr. Uh, John Sr. was born in New York City in the early 20th century and at a young age he had this idea that he wanted to go out and try living as a cowboy. So he went to the bus stop, gave the driver a bunch of money and said take me as far west as this will get me. And then he ended up at a ranch in South Dakota, uh, running away from his parents just completely off a whim. And he spent the next several months there in South Dakota working on a ranch as a cowboy, living out his little fantasy here. And that's where he got to learn how to work with his hands, how to experience nature and appreciate it for what it is, how to find the dignity of hard work, and also the joy and leisure in talking to the other cowboys and ranchers and sitting around the campfire playing songs. Um, so that's really the foundation of where this all got started. John Sr. later in life then moved back to New York and started studying the great books. Um, he would be reading them and he started uh, teaching great books programs at Cambridge. Uh, and it was here that he came across Aquinas. Uh, and this was a complete change in thinking for John Sr. Uh, Aquinas gave him the idea that truth is conforming the mind to reality, to what is. So he had a profound uh, experience and realization with his great books and his uh, coming to Aquinas, and this uh, caused him to convert to Catholicism. And he, once he did that, everything started making sense to him. Like the entire great books program just sort of led him to this moment and this understanding of truth. And he thought that this was the most profound thing, and he wanted to share it with others. He tried teaching it, but that wasn't quite right. And he said, "No, I get, gotta get back to my cowboy days. I gotta get back out into the land." And so. He moved and started teaching out in Wyoming, but he was just giving people, here are the books, and then trying to lead them into his conversion. But that wasn't quite sitting right either. And then so that brought him to the Integrated Humanities program, which he set up at KU. Students started converting to Catholicism through these experiences and this understanding of great literature. And seven of them actually went and joined Fauquembeau, which is a Benedictine monastery in France that had preserved the rule of Saint Benedict and the contemplative life. And they spent the next 25 years there learning how to live as a contemplative Benedictine monk. But they always wanted to come home. And after 25 years, they got their opportunity. The Bishop of Tulsa in, had met them previously and invited them to settle on a piece of land in 
rural eastern Oklahoma. And so in 1999, those seven monks moved back to Oklahoma and started the Clear Creek Monastery in rural eastern Oklahoma. And when they started, they had almost nothing. They were just on this old ranch that they had purchased, and the monks set up their monastery life in an old stable. And so they converted the old horse stalls into the cells where the monks would live. And they built a chapel inside of the barn, and they called that home and just made it work as their monastery for the first year. Now Clear Creek is a full monastery with over 50 monks uh, living the contemplative life. I was personally really hit by the these monks. Um, kind of going in, you just assume a bunch of men living in community, living celibately. Uh, it would kind of be like a sense of loneliness. But these men were, it was the furthest thing. Uh, they lived in such deep community with each other, supported each other. Uh, and they would be a part of prayer together in solemnity. So there were, there were solemn moments with them together. But also they had joy together. They were smiling with each other as they walked the grounds. Um, as they ate together, we, we got to experience eating with them. And them just smiling with each other when they were listening to the, to the daily readings. Um, it's, it's just this beautiful community. And I was really caught by that. Their vision of wonder, their sense of community. And that was so beautiful. What was it about that those classes that then led you to become a monk and oh to found this abbey? Um, what was it about this great books program that generated a Christian, um, this sort of microcosm of a Christian culture here at this abbey? And just saw that somebody knew something, you know, that he knew he, um, yeah, that he had something to teach. He not only was knowledgeable, but he had a meaning for his life. Greeks first semester, semester, Romans second semester with Old Testament, third semester New Testament and some medieval works, and then modern supplement. So, um, and it just unfolded beautifully. You saw they really were able to show us the beauty of the Greeks and the Romans, and then without hitting us over the head with it too much, how it was open and how it was taken up in Christian culture. You know, and it just unfolded before our eyes, really. And they were very good teachers, obviously. You now, like the senior had a real gift to just, and he kind of meditated in class, and we just end up just looking at the beauty of the things we've done. We memorize poetry. We were organized to memorize poetry on our own, kind of on our own, little groups. And at first, the first one was stargazing. We, go, we really just, the city boys, just getting out there and just seeing it. It's beautiful, no doubt about it. And then in this fall, you know, we read the Confession of St. Augustine, which I really lived with him, you know. You mentioned that coming into the church was just obvious for you at a With grace, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like, G.K. Chesson, not that we did all that like he did, but he, somebody goes off on a voyage, they get lost, they're looking for truth or something, or God, and they, they, they in the fog, they wander into this beautiful countryside. And they, nobody will mind. I remember that, I remember that, and you find out, well, I've just come home. It's my home land, so pretty much that to re-nourish, so mainly more imaginative literature than philosophical by far. May they be born in, may they be born in wonder was the motto of the program. That's exactly what they do. They just, so I think the two or three goals of the program was that, wonder, to give us interest in reality, and then give us um, love of Western tradition, Western civilization, and we could go on on our own from there. Go, we didn't have a program of, you know, first we'll show there's a God and then we have a mortal soul. It just didn't work that way. We just read the books. We did have certain themes they wanted to bring in. We just experienced these books and seeing the beauty of it. And then we could go on from ourselves. And very important centers, seniors' view of things to re-nourish, I talk about re-nourishing freshmen, but re-nourishing all of Western civilization. So his, just the basic center of the Baptist Monastery that can go around there. And this idea of culture is fits in there absolutely that uh, you need philosophy, but you need the basis too. You can't have good philosophy without these a good culture, the whole environment. The importance of monasteries for regaining Christian culture. That's 
very central purpose. <laughs> so what is it about Western civilization and the Greeks and the Romans and all of those things that you would study as that sort of base before a Christian culture? I mean, they mentioned a little bit in class. Of course, senior had been in very much in Eastern thought. But, so mainly was just pointing at the beauty of the West, um, rather than arguing that to see the beauty, to experience it, and then we could argue later, kind of. Right. So you're saying that like Western culture sort of answers that those questions of being in reality. Um, you know? in a more full and beautiful way. In the book, um, The Restoration of Christian Culture, I read something where he was talking about, you know, how philosophy and theology are not enough, and then you go down to, he was trying to teach his students to read, like, Charles Dickens or things like that, or yeah, that didn't whatever. Work, yeah. What is this foundational experience? He had a very good, both, he worked on a ranch, he still rode horses, you know, and then he had a very, his mother was big on high culture. They had a lot of very rich culture in his family. And he's, no, he did, but he, had, he didn't have any religious direction. Like I said, he wasn't baptized or anything. His teachers at, at Columbia were excellent, but they didn't direct him that way at all, even towards real truth. They were very good literature teachers. He did read Plato and things. So he got off into Eastern thought, and then when he read St. Thomas, kind of by accident, it just floored him. A year later, he was a Catholic. So, and then he started teaching. Um, trying to teach philosophy and theology to the students and they just didn't work and he realized he didn't have the background. So that's really what he presents is really what showed him that. So like our class was kind of a high school class in a way, what should be reading high school, kind of. And as he got older, he said, well, kids aren't ready for high school yet, really, they need, you know. So he encouraged even people that are a little older to go ahead and Read them. Go back to fairy tales a little bit. At least you can teach your little brother fairy tales. That'd be an excuse to read them yourselves and things like that. So get this first normal. So get a healthy imagination and memory. That's where we draw our thoughts and our emotions from and everything. So that it's pretty. So he just said our imagination is sick. It's disease. It needs to be more kind of reality and more inspiring. Because right, we get cold. <laughs> Church is cold. It's hot. You know. We're just, it's just like anybody living in the country a little bit too, we're just more out in it. And we do it, we do all our own cooking, we do everything ourselves, make our own habits, so we're really, it's pretty re real. Mm -hmm. We don't go to Walmart to buy our clothes and our food, you know, so that's pretty good. And of course the poetic life on the liturgy, you know, where you, it's an experience that lifts you up rather than an abstract, Outside, kind of looking at something, all that, mm -hmm. all right. So all that, definitely, and a very good family life. I mean, very close, all working together. Um, common good is very obvious for us. Very, you know, yes. we, things are made of wood here, you know, and we make our own pottery for the pots. You know, it's just closer to reality. Can you speak more to what is this sort of hidden life as a monk? How is that building culture more than mm -hmm. something? I've heard a lot of people mm -hmm. saying, you know, we need to be. Using technology and the media and being out there and sharing, you can speak to the experience yeah. of sort of protecting the sacredness of yeah. culture here within yeah. the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so. yeah. um, I think we need both. I think, like, you need these foundations. You know, the Middle Ages, the senior Middle Ages, grew out of the, out of the monastic life, the rich Christian culture. He compares, just as kind of a allegory almost. Thomas Aquinas was a monk for like seven, eight years, and his theology grew out of that, and so likewise, the Middle Ages grew out of Benedict and way. Um, and in fact, so people come here, we have contact with a lot of people, nothing compared to the great world, and, but still, there's ripple effect, we have oblates, you know, and people are kind of regularly live around here, and it can kind of spread out that way, plus the supernatural, just contemplative life, prayer in general, you're, I, I'm just, it's kind of an opening window to grace to come in the world. Anyway, in the mystical body of Christ, we have our role, heart, like Trent says. So, so both a very visible human side, I think, really. It can, we can kind of reference so we how we discipline things. It can kind of be families can kind of learn a little bit how to discipline their technology and how to structure more around God and and even a family life. So, God had other people too, and I'm all for you know using the media because it sure is important. We can reach people, and you can reach so many people. I mean, I'm not against that at all, obviously. 
We just need them all. But we need, I think, it's good for everybody to have a reference to a monster. What can we do? What can Benedictine college students do to cultivate authentic culture? Whatever ways can get us back more experiential of the real things and the Christian life, we need that. And knowing it's ensure, you know, our students and culture to read the, you know, some of the good books, have a good Christian culture in you. For senior read out monastic life, he said, okay, some can live near monsters, some can't, but still it's kind of should be a reference for about everybody. What struck me while we were at Clear Creek is I just kept thinking about the parable of the coins in the gospel passage. And these monks, they've been given this tiny parcel of land in the middle of nowhere that nobody else wanted. They said, it's too rocky, you can't farm it, you can't raise cattle. And it was just their one little coin that they were given. And they've taken it, and they've just done nothing but love that spot and dedicate their lives to loving that creation and each other at the monastery. And what they've created is this beautiful community, self-sufficient, and a place to glorify God all hours of the day. I think it was a sacred set-apart time for me to really make pilgrimage to this place and to be able to set aside all the stressors of college life and just living in community and to really just integrate into their prayer and their life um, and to kind of be close to beauty um, at the source, near the heart of really what church and community should look like. And I think that's what's so compelling about living Christian culture is that it's an invitation to us that here at Benedictine College as students, we have a hand in encountering and experiencing the true, the good, and the beautiful, and then bringing it out into the world. So after our time at the monastery and living in community with these monks and these men who are set apart and who love the Lord, we kind of took several things away. Um, for us, the living of Christian culture does not look like burning the television set and getting rid of social media and not checking our grades on Blackboard. Rather, what it looks like is immersing ourselves in reality and continuing to draw back to reality, whether that's through an encounter with nature, through an encounter with the great books, the great philosophers, those who live reality and who know it intimately, whether it's traveling back to a monastery for a service project or just a pilgrimage. And those are kind of more tangible ways that we can live out and continue to live in John Sr.'s legacy in our time at Benedictine and then beyond. John Sr.'s writings on culture, especially the dangers of modern society, are particularly intriguing. He doesn't give the full answer, but he points you in the direction of truth, goodness, and beauty. What I took away from my visit to Clear Creek Monastery was a sense that all Christians need to have a reference to a monastery. I don't have all the answers to this modern technological age. How are we supposed to engage with the culture, live a Christian culture? But I do know that these monks praying in the heart of the church are an integral part of restoring Christian culture. All Christians need to have a reference to a monastery spiritually through prayers, but also perhaps making visits to them. I know that I was personally very renewed by my visit to Clear Creek, and all Christians should be able to experience this connection with the heart of the church, with those who are giving their lives to work in prayer, to living reality, to really rebuild a Christian culture from the inside out.